Hey, everyone, and welcome back to The Negotiation. And on today's show, we are really excited to talk with Tom Nixon, co-founder of Cumin, a China market creative agency. On today's show, we asked Tom about the speed of China, especially compared to the West, and how that has to be embedded into every step of the creative process when building marketing aimed at Chinese consumers. Tom also brings a fascinating perspective on the importance of understanding the device the content will be consumed on, stressing the importance of understanding the aspect ratio of the final product so that it's much more pleasant to see on a mobile phone screen, which is vertical, more than a traditional mode of a TV or computer screen, which are more square. We talk about the types of content resonating with today's Chinese consumers, where Tom dissects brand-produced content versus UGC or user-generated content. Tom also helps us understand the difference between a KOL and a KOC, why your marketing cannot be a one-size-fits-all across China, a country that is not only far more vast than people typically realize, but also far more complex, and the race to reach the second, third, and fourth-tier city consumers. What does China or a Chinese company do well that impresses you most and why? We do see, you know, a lot of people talking about customer experience and putting the customer at the center of, of all of the journeys in the West. But in China, that is being very much driven by an innovation mindset infused by this concept like Chinese speed, which is this pace of innovation, which comes from things like uh, artificial intelligence powered by you know Baidu taking over Google as, as one of the AI powerhouses. But the sort of rapid adoption of Chinese consumers of a lot of uh, innovations has certainly created this uh, hugely innovative uh, market and we see China as the most innovative place in the world for commerce uh, and retail. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia-Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market no globally minded brand should ignore, but entering markets like China is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber and Facebook. Times are changing and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success expanding into the markets of the Middle Kingdom. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early stage tech companies enter the Asia Pacific market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful China entry and growth strategies by interviewing the people behind those success stories. My name is Todd Embley, and welcome to The Negotiation, brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, no, good to be here. I think it's interesting to talk about the speed of China, especially relative to the West. Um, Can you talk a little bit about how that needs to be embedded in every step that a brand takes in the market, just that knowledge of how fast things work? Being successful requires that sales and marketing approach, very customer centric. Uh, It's driven by this, the innovation mindset, which is is largely about um, how to understand all of the services that a customer wants and to roll them out as quickly as possible um, to the point where there are features that are rolled out on some of China's biggest platforms that probably only last a couple of days before they're taken back off. Um, They're not afraid to put things out there and test them live. um, And they're not worried about um, the amount of platforms that Tencent and uh, Alibaba have have launched um, and that subsequently disappeared um, is uh, is a kind of testament to, to how they are constantly putting things out there. Um, and we need to make sure that as a, as a brand, we're also um, ensuring that we are creating, um, I guess, touch points with the consumer that exist on a lot of these, these applications, um, but also testing different ways of interaction with them. And, and that really is where the, the companies that have kind of succeeded best in China have, have, have done that. They've kind of almost broken their, um, their traditional uh, methods of doing marketing and sales um, and adapted them very locally for, for China. So speaking of that, Adaption. How has China's digital marketing space evolved over the last twelve years or so since you know you've been in the market there? Yeah. So for for us, I mean, we've seen a market that has gone from basically being that that copycat uh, type um, creator where they're you know looking at platforms in the West where whereby you know we had our um, 
uh, Facebooks and MSM messengers and um, Twitters and and they you know were effectively taking those features, um, but because they had the innovation mindset, they were taking those features, but they were adding another uh, a layer onto it. So when we first started the agency, um, we we were um, you know working primarily on. Um, a sort of like a web 2.0 version of marketing, which was website, drive traffic to website, supported with a bit of content on Weibo um, and some outdoor advertising. Uh, and that was, that was kind of largely, largely it. Um, Tmall and Alibaba were kind of still in, in growth stage and WeChat was beginning to, to generate you know, a huge number of users, but marketers weren't quite sure exactly what they were going to do on, that, on those platforms. Um, but now what we see is, is, is in the last sort of uh, 10 years, China's gone from you know, what was largely referred to as like a copycat nation to that kind of um, now we, we see glimpses of the future of what's going to happen in the West uh, through things that are happening in China. Like short form video is, is, a, is a prime example of that, that um, yeah, in China, uh, short form video platforms are so much more innovative than anything that we're, we're kind of seeing here. So looking at, um, you know, the way that Douyin is used and, and how actually now, um, in a full screen vertical video is that kind of main way of like consuming uh, a lot of entertainment content in, in China. But the, the biggest changes that we've, we've seen, um, is, is basically fundamentals in the way that social, has changed social media has changed um and we've seen how there's this huge shift in how people would generate and uh, consume content um and how platforms broadcast uh content so in china there were kind of three 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 reasons why um it was happening so much like there's basically uh immer- immersion um so uh, I just kind of met, touched upon sort of Douyin there as a as a platform, um, which has a short video platform, uh, being full screen video. Um, it it really is built. Uh, the plat the the app is built to give you a really rich experience. It's not like trying to take one format and shoehorn it into another platform. Like trying to watch a vertical video on YouTube is is just the worst experience ever. So you always have to rotate your phone. Now what China is, is is has is that they're actually building these these platforms to create the best possible experience, and people are respondent to change. So uh, once you roll out a big change like moving from um, sixty nine to nine sixteen, and terms of um, horizontal to vertical video, um, people were like, "Oh, this is actually good because the platform they built." creates a nice experience for it and people are, are really willing then to, to kind of move over and they don't have any legacy behaviors or attachments to legacy technology like they do we do in the west um like we're still using desktop computers and, and, and google and websites uh, largely for the way we do e-commerce for example um and then we have the innovation which we kind of already touched upon before but they've they've seen in just a short space of time how changing uh, adopting new technologies has a positive um, improvement on your life and on your lifestyle. So China has seen that more than any other place uh, on the planet. So, you know, when in 10 years ago, trying to buy something online was a very difficult thing to do in China. And because of the in- incredible rapid innovation they've got uh, moving to like the number one e-commerce market um, and mobile payment markets being, being able to sort of, um, ease the use of cash and cash was a very difficult thing to spend in China because uh, as you know, you, you need to carry huge wads of money to, to spend large sums of um, large sums in luxury stores and various things and credit cards weren't really uh, sort of widely um, adopted. So um, people were seeing these kind of like great improvements using innovation. And the last one is, is kind of entertainment. Um, so China's typically had a kind of very, um, I guess there's government influence on it and, and, and entertainment uh, and media. Um, but um, there was never really any sort of uh, really strong, rich um, uh, entertainment channels where they would had almost become accustomed to consuming uh, their 
uh, format, the, the entertainment through a particular format, i.e., television, um, wasn't as as kind of widespread as it as it would have been uh, over over many many decades in the West. So to try to get us to stop watching TV um, is probably quite a challenge. Whereas in China, because of the sort of uh, access creation of the access to mobile internet versus like uh, hard hard lines sort of um, uh, desktop computers and everything that uh, a lot of people were began to to kind of view a lot of uh, TV through through mobile um, so what we've kind of seen is like a move from these sort of old ways of doing social media uh, where um, when we think back and, and think back to something like uh, MySpace, for example, which is kind of first generation of social, um, which is probably MySpace is probably like the first social media channel to ever exist. Um, but there weren't really before that anything that had social feeds. So um, MySpace was kind of like a network led structure. You kind of had to go and visit each user's profile individually um, you had to go and find content for them uh, on those profiles, um, but it was the first sort of place where people on social could go and and, and post their own information. Um, and then we moved to sort of second generation social, which is what we kind of largely still know in the West, which is uh, aggregated social feeds. So, for example, Facebook, you can go on your feed and you can see um, content that. You know, to some degree has an algorithm in into it, but it's more of an algorithm based on um, who you follow. Um, and uh, then it's largely uh, now integrated with ads. So we look at Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, they're all aggregated feeds. Um, so what we get now in China, um, which is where China has become that, that you know, innovative uh, nation where now the rest of the world is looking at China and going, wow, well, um, they, they, they really are sort of changing the way that people consume information um, is what we, you know, look at as sort of the third generation of, of social where it's, it's largely content led rather than network led. So it's not based on uh, all of the people you follow or the people you're connected with. Um, it's, uh, based on sort of deep learning algorithms, artificial intelligence. Um, and it's also integrating things like uh, commerce and e-commerce and services in, into those things. So you're basically now in a, in a world in China where a lot of the platforms um, begin to learn very quickly and very well about your content preferences um, about your your interests, um, they gain glean a huge amount a huge amount of information from you, um, and can begin to sort of even tailor services and commerce to you. So it, it's certainly um, with the role of sort of AI dictating what they see uh, by each piece of content is makes it a very interesting space uh, for for marketing. I think what you mentioned about the aspect ratio, even of just the screens. You know the sixteen nine nine sixteen. That, that's very interesting. I've never actually thought about that and the way that you know the 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 size of the screen on which we are absorbing um, content. Um, like you said, it, you know the old TV boxes were square. You know, especially yeah. in the U.S. and probably in the U.K. as well, they were literally you know whatever like 10 by 10 or whatever it was right um, and then of course we saw screens and laptops move to this kind of 69 this widescreen uh, and then of course mobile phones are completely different but that that's now where everybody absorbs their content and gets their content from so it has to be recognized and understood and I think there's a lot of opportunity for those that recognize and get on that earlier like you said the way you guys are coming in and giving that advice to make people aware of just FYI the pack is the box that that every, all the work that we do has to be has to look like this um, so I think that's very interesting yeah I mean when you when you actually think about it the the 69 format is you know it's far better for um uh, TV type content because you can you obviously have uh, a much larger space, a wider space to play with, with, with you know uh, various bits of um, mm. 
scenery that you want or what you can't have you can't have shots. the full cast of friends on the screen no. at the same time when it's <laughs> 916 exactly and it's more suited to our natural vision i mean we have a peripheral like a large peripheral vision as a human being True. um so actually like it's you know it's it is a better format but what it what it doesn't do and, and this is this is where mobiles come on you know come, um have a sort of power of their own is that when you're trying to uh, engage with somebody on a mobile phone and if you think about the main action that you do when you're holding your phone it's it's just moving your thumb up and down that's that's literally what people will, will do most of the time so when you're on the feeds you're on the linkedin feed or you're on the facebook feed or or, or on instagram the the thing that you're trying to do as a marketer is you're trying to do what we call thumb stopping power it's you're trying to get somebody to go, oh, I'm going to stop swiping. I like that. That's that's for me. And what full screen vertical video does is is it just creates this. It actually becomes immersive because you're you're concentrating so much on this this very small screen so that you can stop it with your thumb. And you can't do that if it's like if you're holding the phone horizontal and uh, and, and creating a so, so what what the vertical video format allows you to do is consume a huge number more uh, of amount more videos um, because of the way it's, it's kind of set up for the, so they're thinking not just of um, a user experience in terms of the, the platform itself, but of, of how people are actually uh, engaging with their, their kind of um, their hands and everything with that particular piece of technology. So it was, yeah, it's a very smart um, approach to, to kind of how they, and, and the reason why I think uh, it, it's been so successful and obviously adding artificial intelligence on top of that means that they are actually tracking how long you're dwelling on each video, what your click, your, what your thumb is doing. Like that just adds uh, a, a whole nother a level to um, how they can begin to sort of serve you content that you're going to create like actions on and, and even the layouts of, the, of that particular app. Um, are just mm-hmm. super smart in the way that they're getting you to to like things, share things. They're all just positioned so nicely on that on that device uh, that you just have to just slightly move your when you move your thumb out of the way when you watch a video, it hovers just over like the share button on the end. So it's just yeah, they've done a very good job with that platform. If we move beyond the discussion of platform aspect ratio, uh, UI UX CX type of you know creating the box. If we then talk about what's inside the box, can yeah. you speak a little bit about the actual creative that is hopefully resonating with the Chinese consumer, which may even lead to a discussion around the culture of today's Chinese consumer? What are they eating up? Uh, you may notice you know, in the West that you know some very positive post by somebody who's really in love with something gets like tons and tons of people hitting that like button where somebody who says something raw but potentially maybe a little bit negative gets almost no attention whatsoever what what is the kind of creative that is resonating with the chinese consumer today when when it comes to content that resonates with chinese consumers i guess there's um from our perspective there's there's obviously two types of content there's um marketing content which is produced by the brands um or, me, or media content and then there is the the ugc content so the stuff that's kind of uh is liked and shared which is created by the the um i guess uh, the consumers themselves now in china there's uh, a lot of um acronyms for for the influencer market um so for a long time we had KOLs, the key opinion leaders, um, which are effectively just you know in- influencers that have um, yeah a huge amount of um, power in China and what they do. And then now there's something that they've they've coined as KOC, um, and uh, that's um, largely a sort of looking at the more of the micro um, type of influencers. So. One of the things that we always like to look at is um, what what is going to be the next sort of trend and what is going to be the future of that, and that's kind of based on, on what kind of things that that we think uh, people are trying to um, engage with a lot more. So, what we when we create media type content, um, a lot of the the style and, and um, 
sort of feeling that we try to put into it. it a lot of it's very emotional. Um, Chinese creative um, always um, is versus Western creative is very much more, uh, it's either more tear jerky or more uh, comedic, um, often quite pa- um, creating a lot of parody. Um, and they also, in terms of its style, it's always it's very um, animated in, in the way it's, it's created. Um, I, I always use the analogy of uh, when we go back to look at old Chinese websites where they're all uh, very much um, covered in big giant flash banners. Um, and then I look now at some of the modern Chinese design, which is, is a lot more clean. There still is a lot of design out there when you go on platforms like Tmall and, um, uh, and, and look at um, other sort of um, Chinese social media apps. There's, uh, especially Chinese TV shows, uh, game shows and things like that. You'll, you see it. There's a lot of animation going on. There's a lot of flashing around going on. And there's platforms like Billy Billy where people are firing uh, strings of text across the screen. Um, for, for somebody like myself that has ADHD, it's great because there's just lots of things going on that you can kind of engage with and, and hook into. But um, for, for somebody in the West that, you know, that's used to watching something like uh, The Crown on Netflix um, and then they go and see um, the way that uh, people are watching um, TV shows in, in, in China on the uh, video on demand platforms, you know, it's a very different experience. There's always a lot of stuff going on. There's always a lot of things trying to grab your eye, grab your attention. Um, well, that even speaks to the way websites you know, are designed there. I mean, you and I both know we visited a lot of Chinese websites even five years ago, and it was just flashing lights every, every, you know, there was no concept of white space adding to the culture of the website. It was just fill that with a blinking something. Yeah, sure. And and, and I know some some have cleaned up, but um, like Huawei, a lot of the tech websites look look quite nice now. Um, But but then you you get, you get, um, you know, Tmall, for example. Um, When you go on a Tmall product page, there is just so much content there. Like, and, and Tmall itself has become a content platform. Um, and, uh, there's, there's just, there's no, there's no shortage of, um, of things to, to look at and, and, and kind of engage with. But like, what's a really interesting stat for me is like, where is that kind of content appearing and what kind of content are people engaging with in, in different places? So for example, like Chinese teenagers now, um, if you think of what's the number one social media platform in China, it's, it's WeChat, right? With a billion users. So you'd think that as the number one sort of social media, network, that would be where the majority of people are posting that content. But actually only 15%, that's one 5% of Chinese teenagers are posting on WeChat moments, which is a very small number um, of, of, of people. And that's, that's largely be- because for them, it's just not an interesting place to post your your content. It's it's sort of a text image or, or very basic video format, and um, they're not going to get that recognition that a teenager wants of, of the things that they're posting because that WeChat audience, because WeChat has become more the um, the main form of communication with their family as well as their friends, is that if they put some quirky uh, anime video on there that they share with their friends there their grandmother is also going to see it because she's on wechat um so a lot of uh what we like to see is is where people are engaging with content but also the platforms that they begin to then uh migrate to so um that's why you know, when we look at um sort of something like uh, a doyin platform or a short video platform or even like a little red book anything like that there's quite a lot of opportunity for 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 kind of brands to um adapt their their content to sort of different age demographics uh, and that's where some of the brands that do really well in china are utilizing let's say on wechat they're creating a lot of services and they're doing a lot of branding and marketing through the services that they're creating through wechat because wechat is largely um a service-based platform rather than a, a content platform it's more of a um, a comms platform or a, uh, a you know uh, an app within an app um, so it's all about servicing that particular customer now when we look at more of the media channels or the, uh, the sort of short video channels that's where you can um, create really good content and that's where 
influencers become quite important because then you can um, begin to create a lot of uh, funny videos, a lot of parody videos. Um, KFC did a, a really a good campaign over uh, Christmas, um, which is, again, it's quite an interesting concept of, of doing a Christmas uh, campaign in, in, in China, um, where Christmas isn't traditionally celebrated. Um, but they used a, an influencer who became hugely popular um, through, he was a male influencer who became hugely popular through wearing makeup. Um, so uh, they, they kind of did a, a campaign with him and a really famous uh, Chinese actor as well. And, um, and that particular uh, creative was, was very much um, uh, about having that kind of element of, of kind of comedy to it. Um, and so there, there is the, the kind of brand side, which is doing that, but then on the platforms like the um, Douyin's and uh, um, uh, platforms where it's, it's kind of more focused on user generated content, there is a kind of shift now um, from people that maybe on platforms like Weibo were almost commentators on things that were happening uh, in society, or they might have been commentators on things that are happening in fashion or in, um, uh, in, in lifestyle or sport. And so what, what you get, you get KOLs, key opinion leaders that were literally sort of co collecting information. There was a very famous one in the UK called here in the UK who, who literally, um, would, um, post stories on, on Weibo and, and WeChat about things that were happening in the UK. And it was largely stuff that was pulled from, sort of uh tabloid newspapers you know the, the equivalent of sort of stories about ufos landing in in fields in various places and and sort of just localizing that and posting it onto these platforms so it didn't require it required more of a journalistic skill than a, a creative skill um and people began to build up these large followings because uh china was content hungry and um they were really interesting in, in finding out all of these kind of like different people's opinions and everything. Now that's happened for, for so many years, people are actually beginning to truly appreciate uh, content that's created by people with talent. Um, that's actually created uh, for like communities. There's a lot of subcultures that exist in China. There's a lot of, um, you know, eclectic taste in music or art or fashion. Now it's not a kind of one size fits all. Um, it's not really a homogenous, um, mass culture. Like, uh, we used to sort of perceive China as, you know, you go to karaoke and all the pop music you know, sounds relatively similar. Um, we have sort of rap of China being the number one, um, sort of TV show in, in China, like last year, um, rap, rap music has now become mainstream. So if rap, rap music is mainstream, that means that there's, there's so many other um, musical sort of tastes that are out there. Um, so what we're seeing is that we're seeing a shift from journalist-type led content to creator-led content. And, and so we really see uh, a lot of opportunity for brands to begin to collaborate with, with actual creators. So we're talking about like artists, uh, singers, rappers, but at a probably a more micro micro level than necessarily as a like a celebrity level and because of um content focused platforms like the which is all about video and music you actually those creative pieces become like forms of entertainment you mentioned the kols but then you also mentioned a term um that kols have maybe kind of shifted over to klcs can you just explain what is a klc yeah, sure. So, um, I guess the, uh, because of the blend between, uh, social media and, and commerce. Um, so a lot of, uh, social media platforms are also, um, selling product through them and a lot of product platforms like, uh, T-Malls are also becoming social media platforms. So, hmm. um, what originally was sort of looked at as a key opinion leaders, which were kind of judged a lot of the time on their kind of, uh, reach and there were, you know, big influencers and there are also small micro influencers and celebrities and things like that. Um, they, they then began to be this group of people, which, um, I, I kind of touched upon in when I was talking about the KFC, mm -hmm. uh, campaign I did over Christmas. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the particular guy who was like, um, really, really good at selling uh, female lipstick. Um, 
is uh, what we would call a KOC. And our KOC is a key opinion consumer. And uh, a, a key opinion consumer is, is somebody that's, um, I guess, a lot more focused on uh, product incentives. So you get a lot of live streaming platforms now in China that are selling product uh, he- heavily through them. And they literally be people who will sit in front of um, ca- multiple cameras that are uh, sort of live streaming to different sites, but they're, they're giving their opinions on lots of products and selling those products then through the, those channels. They are known as, as KOCs. Right. Um, you also have the platform Little Red Book uh, in China as well, which is, is also influencers on there are often viewed as, as kind of being uh, K- KOCs. Um, there's not really... There's a few sort of Western type, uh, I guess, comparisons, um, but not not really in the mainstream. So, uh, sort of Amazon Vine uh, exists, which is kind of like a system to have like trusted reviewers mm. and things on it. So, mm. um, that that kind of I guess is, is similar to a, a kind of KOC. So it's, it's people whose opinions are are quite heavily trusted on on products. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and you mentioned UGC. That's user generated content, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Speaking, um, and and you 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 were speaking about teenagers as a as a particular consumer demographic earlier on. Yeah. Um, there are there's a lot of work that's done to try to capture the Shanghai Beijing. Right. Or those with a high disposable income, like, you know, recent university graduates or, or things like this. What about those, the lesser focused on how, how do we reach people that, that might not be Shanghai or Beijing based, but are still quite influential groups of consumers? You know, you know, what are their online habits and how do we reach them? So con- uh, consumers in, I guess, so-called lower, lower t- tier cities. So China has got less developed urban centers. Um, that really is where the kind of, um, the next wave of, of consumption growth is coming from in China. So, uh, rising incomes is leading to sort of upgrades in, in lifestyle. Um, so a lot of people are looking for, you know, these higher quality, higher quality goods, but, um, still at kind of relatively reasonable prices, um, because of, I guess the, the great access now to, to kind of product in China, um, means that, you know, people want those deals. They want those, they want those bargains as well. Um, and so often, uh, what we're seeing is that platforms that are able to, uh, not just provide those products, but, um, provide them in a way that, um, is entertaining, but also taps into that kind of, uh, discount culture and, um, and, and growth culture, uh, we're seeing like a lot of success of group buying platforms, cross border e-commerce channels, um, and uh, a good example of that is is Pindordor, um, which uh, I guess l- listed on Nasdaq, uh, I, b- I believe it was uh, last year. Um, and they they basically uh, ultimately grew out of creating a sort of gamified way of pulling together lots of um, lots of your friends and family, um, and also random strangers, um, to to basically get get deals. Um, so uh it it kind of shows that um those particular um places although um we've probably never heard of them in the west uh it's really important to to kind of understand a lot of these cities like there are i think just four tier one cities there's 46 second tier cities in china but there's 193 third tier cities and 696 fourth tier cities. I mean, wow. it's a phenomenal, uh, uh, sort of, um, you know, huge urban centers. And what we, what we've kind of, um, always tried to educate people around is, is in terms of clusters in China, because when you work in a market that's big, your marketing can't be a one size fits all solution for the whole of China because people are experiencing different different in, uh, environments, different atmospheres. They, uh, the, there's, there's lots of different languages, localizations and things that you need to take into consideration. Um, and uh, and that's, that's really where there's, there's, again, there's a lot of opportunity for, for brands to go in and, and sort of um, start in some of these smaller tier cities and even test uh, different types of models. Um, 
and we're actually seeing a lot of interest from uh, we work with a lot of football clubs we work with Manchester United um, we work with Barcelona Football Club um, but we also have uh, football clubs that um, although they're in the Premier League like uh, Watford is one of our clients um, then they're not they're not going to be supported by a lot of people in the big in the big cities because the big cities uh, they're they're already going to have their allegiances to the big clubs, the main nights, the Liverpools, the uh, the Arsenal cities. Um, so they're actually looking at, at strategies whereby they can begin to build followings in some of the the lower tier cities because actually though those consumers because they're becoming newly affluent they they begin to pick up new interests new hobbies um and so when there's like a younger generation of people that are picking the kind of sports teams they're going to follow there's also the younger people in the um tier 3 to 6 cities that are actually um you know they're not going to be as familiar with the you know the big the big teams and they want to be a bit different to the mm-hmm. people that are living in a tier one so there, there's opportunities there to kind of build mm-hmm. build sort of fan bases and, and mm-hmm. things like that um but for sports brands there so it's quite a an exciting a, an area for us that we we kind of like to um uh help our clients to, to understand and um and and benefit from what do you see as some of the more frequent mistakes that western brands are making even in the way they are thinking or the type of content or creative that they want to put out there? Yeah, I think majority of the mis- mistakes um, that have been made in, made in the past, um, I think a lot of the time you can kind of recover from a lot of mistakes. Like um, a big famous one, it was D and G. Um, they, they kind of had a very offensive uh, ad in China where they just completely miss misread what uh how china was going to react to some of their like stylistic photography where they they kind of had models um sort of take uh, in a photo shoot against um sort of everyday looking people but the contrast made it look like they were almost mocking um some of the the kind of um the poorer mm-hmm. elements of, of chinese mm-hmm. society mm-hmm. and then another one where they were making jokes about chinese people eating um spaghetti and, and things with, with chopsticks and they didn't go down well they got boycotted and things like that but dng sales are still doing pretty well in china um so the, the brand isn't dead the, I, I actually made it a, a point when i went to shanghai last to go and visit a dng store and it was as busy as it as it ever was so um a, lo- a lot of time marketers we like to uh we like to use those examples and and, and fill linkedin with loads of stories about how western brands fail in china because they don't understand culture um mm-hmm. because it, ha- it guess it helps us do our marketing a little bit better um but i guess the truth of the matter is i don't i don't actually think they're, they're the biggest issues I, I really think understanding the customer uh touch points and ecosystems is is the kind of biggest mistakes that, mm-hmm. that people make um often i'll have um companies call me up and say hey um we need to be doing more content on wechat and i'm like okay so you're you kind of have you've done enough research to basically uh, understand that wechat is an important platform in china um <laughs> but why do you why do you think just putting out content on wechat is going to help your brand uh brand grow mm-hmm. so i think i think a lot of the time the understanding of uh the platforms is 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 still not really there i think they look at wechat and go oh, it's got a billion people on we can just go on wechat or we can just go on tmall and we make loads of sales it doesn't work like that um yeah. and that, that's often a lot of time we see people fail when they launch on tmall is because they think that just by putting a tmall page up they're going to get some sales um which just just doesn't doesn't happen what what we uh sort of have a blend of is, is first understanding the platforms but then it's about the people and the cultures because um that's really where you can create really good storytelling and, and good stories and and a lot of the time content in uh, western brands have done for china has been kind of localized um and uh not really created specifically for the china market um so you know the fact that KFC are doing fried chicken ads with a beauty influencer that sells lipstick and uh, and a pop star, um, and they were both sort of wearing uh, white shirts with the, sort of the uh, the cowboy type little tassels that they have, yeah, yeah, Colonel yeah, Sanders esque. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it just seems completely off the wall, uh, crazy, but um, it you know it works for that market, and uh, a lot of the time I think. Um, 
brands don't they're not brave enough or bold enough to to just create content that uh just feels a little bit uncomfortable to them but will really resonate with the market like the last few years we've done so much manga work uh we won an award last year for a campaign with may united which was a manga piece we're doing a couple of manga things now for chinese new year and we just saw just yesterday Airbnb released a, uh, a manga animation with Taiko Studios, which is made up of some ex Disney guys in China, and it's beautiful. It's it's a really beautiful piece of animation. Um, tells a very nice, um, relevant Chinese New Year story. It positions the product really nicely in that story, um, and it feels very local. Um, I I would really advise anybody that wants to understand what Chinese marketing looks like, there's a fantastic website called Digitaling. So digital and then ING, digitaling.com. And you can just go on there. It's in Chinese, but it's easy to navigate. Um, has good good UX. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and you'll see a lot of the campaigns on there will fall into one of sort of three formats. One is animation. Like there is a lot of animation there. Mm -hmm. The other one is a tear jerky drama style over the top ad, which just reminds me of like my favorite Chinese like TV shows, um, which is, uh, another form of, of, um, advertising largely TVC, mm -hmm. uh, ads, uh, they use that for. And then, um, and then there's the comedic stuff where it's sort of parodies and, and over the top funny and a bit slapstick, mm -hmm. um, which uh, is a kind of the other format. And, and that's kind of largely where everything falls into. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of good stuff out there. And I, I would always say to people that the, the brands that haven't done very well, it's not really so much about the, the content. It's making sure the content is in the right places and, and is actually getting uh, visibility and cut through to the consumers. Um, another area as well is uh, investment into media. Um, often we we see people say, okay, well, we want to sell in China and we've got a, a budget that is probably less than the budget you would spend on marketing to Austria. Um, and then when it's a population you know, of 1.4 billion and uh, you've got all of these clusters and you've got different regions where you know it's different um, – sort of dialects and, and, and different uh, environments and weather and all these kind of things that that budget doesn't really go anywhere. And it's, you can be super targeted, but you can only be super targeted if you, you know, become targeted with your, uh, your creative and, and everything as well. So um, trying to, to do, uh, help clients navigate that is, is often one of the biggest challenges. And uh, I think a lot of people go in and they go in and tier one cities um, and it's extremely, extremely difficult to get cut through in a, in a tier one city um, because of mm -hmm. the price of media and the volume of product that these people are exposed to on a, on a daily basis. You're the Nostradamus of digital marketing in China. What does the future hold? I, <laughs> I get asked this question <laughs> a lot. I get asked this question a lot, and I always laugh because – the the future is the things that we were actually talking about two three years ago, because in reality, um, whenever people talk about trends that are happening in China, those 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 trends don't actually filter through to marketing till a couple of years later. So uh, people were talking about AI like a couple of years ago, and it's only now that we're beginning to see a couple of like AI driven platforms or AI driven applications and, and things like that. So. Um, and even like VR, people were talking about VR like three or four years ago and mm -hmm. um, VR is really only, it was only used in a novelty way um, and it's only be, be, will become with 5G will become to be a, a really, you know, uh, integral part of, of marketing. So uh, when we look at trends, if we're looking at China, 5G is the absolute game changer. Like we don't, e we haven't even comprehended in the West what 5g is going to do to the internet in, 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 in the world, but it's not even like, I don't know what it's like in Canada, but, uh, we're, we're pretty slow on the uptake here in, uh, in the UK on 5g. So, um, the rollout of 5g across China will, will mean that, um, people are able to utilize, uh, technologies such as, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, 
um, so much more effectively because of the amount of data that can be downloaded through those through those mobile devices. Um, so we're certainly going to see some some really creative uh, uses of that um, over over the next uh, sort of twenty four months um, uh, in China, and that's going to continue. And China will become the market leaders on using this technology. Yeah. I'm a big fan of social commerce. Um, I think the stuff that's happening in social commerce in China is uh, absolutely groundbreaking. Um, I um, often refer to it as the QVC shopping channel on crack, um, but live streaming um, is going to continue to be a, you know, a hugely important um, area for, for brands to begin to understand and, and to navigate. Um, and how do you get across your brand messaging um, through live streaming, which is, is going to be an interesting, uh, interesting space. Um, the other area that, that I think we uh, as an agency um, are, are kind of really uh, looking kind of looking forward to and uh, and, and think is going to be um, you know, again uh, utilized by a lot more platforms is is short video I think we um, we love short video here just because um, of the format of it uh, and the way that um, a lot of it in China now is is kind of focused around self development and learning, so it's a huge number of of people that are now using short video as a way to to better better themselves and 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 I think with the with Western brands especially um, the education piece is is quite important. We you know with the heritage that a lot of Western companies have or um, they want to dial up their uh, credentials around you know safety and um uh and uh and the history that the educational piece needs to become part of that and you can do really good storytelling through through video so we're certainly looking at, at ways to uh, create more chinese content but might not necessarily always have to be shot and created in china um so i think for like travel destinations or brands that um you know, want to sell their biggest asset, which, which actually might be, if you're a Swiss chocolate company, it might be the, the Alps. You want to bring the Alps to life. And, and so you want to be creating content for Chinese platforms in the Alps. Um, and that's something that uh, I think is we're going to see a, a lot more of is, is brands creating um, video content teams or working with agencies to create more uh, short video uh, content um, for, for these sort of super video apps that are getting big traction. What is the number one piece of advice you'd give to a company that was looking to enter China? So my number one piece of advice um, to a brand that's looking to uh, enter into China or, or, or uh, expand their China strategy is uh, very much going back to what I was saying about innovation being critical mm. to fueling growth. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So obviously China being the most innovative place in the world for, for kind of commerce and, and retail and uh, digital, um, but it's not every company has kind of figured out an innovation process that aligns with its culture and category. So uh, many companies that have failed competing in, in Chinese market. Um, so Marks and Spencer's a big British company left in 2017, New Look 2018, um, Forever 21 is another eco brand uh, that left in 2019. Um, a lot of the time, uh, that failure is, is down to kind of like innovation in the marketplace. Uh, people don't realize that companies like Alibaba succeeded because there were 10,000 other Alibabas competing at the same time. Um, it was, you know, it's dog eat dog out there and it's, it's very, very heavily competitive. Um, but China doesn't really have a culture of, of, of risk taking. So it's, it's a very interesting when you're trying to, uh, enter into the China market, you need to have a level of innovation. You need to be have a risk taking culture um, to be innovative. But what the people you hire will be risk adverse. So how do you create that culture with the with the people that you're bringing into your company? And so what we see in the most successful companies to do that have created teams within their organization that share the accountability that make other people feel safer to take those risks. And those companies have done phenomenally well. Uh, General Motors is a, is a fantastic example of, of that. Um, so we would always advise people, um, make sure that you begin to have a, an innovation mindset um, and, and structure teams uh, in China around uh, you know, being creative, 
taking those risks, launching products quickly to market and testing and learning. You've got to have a test and learn mindset when mm-hmm. it comes to uh, operating at China speed. Awesome advice. Thank, thanks so much, Tom. Where can our listeners find you, get in touch, follow, like, share your content, etc.? Yeah, so the best place would be on LinkedIn. Um, we have a good presence on, on LinkedIn. So uh, Qmin, Q-U-M-I-N. Um, just give us a search on, on, on LinkedIn uh, and then you can follow there. And we also have uh, a China uh, marketing um, newsletter that uh, we, we kind of send out on a, on a bi-weekly basis at the moment. And you can sign up for that on Qmin's website, which is qumin.co.uk. Awesome. Tom Nixon, co-founder of Cumin. Ken, thank you enough. Thanks for coming on, bud. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking across the pond for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope that you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands just like yours enter China. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation. And if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co. And be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Zai Jing.